Hello everyone, welcome to the special CUBE conversation here in the Palo Alto studios of the CUBE. Part of our People First project with Mayfield Fund and co-creation with the CUBE, I'm John Furrier, your host. Very special guest, Judy Estrin, she's the CEO of J-Labs and author of the book, Closing the Innovation Gap. Uh, she's also well known for being an internet entrepreneur pioneer, worked on the initial TCP IP protocol with Vin Cerf, from went to UCLA, Stanford, great history in computer science. You have computer systems in your blood, mm -hmm. and now you're mentoring a lot of companies, author, you do a lot of work, and you're, you're lending your voice to some cutting edge issues here in Silicon Valley and around the world. Thanks for joining me today for the conversation. Thank you, it's fun to be here. So first of all, I love the fact that you're here. You're a celebrity mm -hmm. in the com com computer industry circles. You were there at the beginning when the computer systems of the internet were being connected. As they built out, it started the whole systems revolution in the 80s and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. Now we have cloud computing and now we're seeing a whole nother level step function of scale. And so you've kind of seen it all. You've seen all, I mean, all the waves actually. <laughs> um, some like me can say I've seen some of the waves, mm -hmm. but you've seen all of them. The most compelling thing I think that's happening now is the convergence of you know, social science and, tech and computer science, it's kind of our motto, Silicon Angle. You recently wrote two posts on Medium mm -hmm. that, that have been kind of trending and going viral. Um, I want to get your perspective on that. And, and they're, they're interesting because they're, they bring a little bit of computer science called the authoritating, author Tarian technology, right. reclaiming control, part two, attention, part one. We go into great detail to lay out some big picture computer industry mm -hmm. discussions. What is it all about? What's, what's, the, what's the idea behind these stories? So let me back up a little bit in that, um, I, as you said, and we can go into this if you want, I was very involved in a lot of the uh, innovation that happened in the valley in terms of microprocessors, the internet, networking, everything that laid the foundation for a lot of the things we see today. Um, incredible opportunities for my career, for problems we solved. Over the last uh, 10 years, 10, 12 years, um, I began to see a shift, and a shift in the culture, and a shift in the way uh, technology was impacting us. And it, it's not all good or bad, it's that it felt like we were out of balance and that we were becoming shorter and shorter term focused. And actually my book in 2008, Closing the Innovation Gap, the main message there is, let's not forget about the seeds you plant that all of this comes from because we're reaping the benefit of those seeds, we're not planting new seeds. And that we were becoming in the valley, in the nation, the way we thought about things, more and more short-term focused, and technology was causing some of that, and benefiting, and not been, and and at a disadvantage because of that. So that started with my book in 2008, and then in 2014, I think it was, I did a TED talk, um, a TEDx talk, uh, called Balancing Our Digital Diets. And I was even more concerned that we were out of whack in terms of the consequences of innovation and I drew an analogy to our food s systems where so much innovation in creating cheap calories and energy and things like high fructose corn syrup that it took years to realize that, oh, there are some negative consequences of that innovation. And so that was kind of a, a warning that um, we weren't thinking enough about the consequences of, at that point, social media. That was before fake news, and I talked about tweets and how uh, truth that lies went faster than truth, yeah. not knowing how bad that situation was going to be. And then, leading up to the election and after the election, we all know and have all learned now about the impacts of these technologies on our democracy and, I believe, on our society and humanity. And I don't think it's just about uh, our election system. I think it's about our psyches and how the technologies are impacting the way we think, our fear and anxiety level of our kids and us as adults. So I've been talking to people about it and advising and I finally decided as uh, I was collaborating with people that I felt that a lot of the awareness was in pockets that we talked about data privacy or we talked about addiction. 
but these are things are all interrelated. And so I wanted to, one, add my voices as technologists, because I think a lot of the people who are writing the, uh, building the awareness and talking about it, if you are uh, in government or a journalist or a, even a social scientist, people can, it's real easy to say, yeah, you say that, but you don't understand. It's more complicated than that. You don't understand the technology. So one, I do understand the technology. So I felt adding my voice as a technologist, um, but I'm also uh, just increasingly concerned about what we do about it and that we take a more holistic view. So that's what, what, what the uh, pieces are about and the reason I broke it into two pieces is because they're too long for most people even the way they are, but the first is to build awareness of the problems, which we can dig into at a high level if you want, and then the second is to throw out ideas as we move towards discussing solutions. So let me take a breath because you were going to jump in yeah. and then I can. No, it's just it's good. Mm -hmm. so you're connecting the foundational um, of technology, foundation of technology, right. identifying impact, right. looking at pockets of awareness, mm -hmm. and then looking at how it's all kind of coming together. Right. When, I, when you talk like that, the first thing in my mind is, like, oh, subsystem, inter interrupt bus, you know, connection. So it's almost like, a, like a, an operating system. Mm -hmm. And I think the society that you're pointing out in the article, the first one intention was, they're all interrelated, and I think that's the key part. Mm -hmm. I think that's interesting because you know we run into people all the time when we do our our, our cube broadcasts that have awareness here and don't know what's going on right. there. So there's con context right. that's highly cohesive, but there's no connection. Right. So they're decoupled. Right. But highly cohesive. That's kind of a systems architecture concept. Right. So how do we create a robust technology societal system where technology and I think that's a thread that we're seeing, this is what I, I, I gleaned out of the articles was, mm -hmm. you're kind of raising the uh, flag a little bit to the notion of big picture, right? system, kind of a foundational, right. but let's look at consequences and interrelationships, and how can we kind of orchestrate and figure out right. solutions. And so what, what, what was the reaction? Expand on that concept, because this is where I was, it was provocative to me. Right, so I think there are two thought trains that I just went down. One is that one of the problems we have that has been created by technology and technology is uh, suffering from, again, it's cause and both cause and effect, is uh, not enough system thinking. And so one issue, which is not just, this is not just about social media, not just about AI, but over the last 20 years, we've increasingly trained, I think, our, uh, engineers and computer scientists in more transactional thinking. And as we move quicker and quicker to solve problems, we are not uh, training our leaders or training our uh, technologists to think in terms of systems. And so what do I mean by systems is two things, that you can break, uh, any problems have pieces, but those pieces are interconnected. We are interconnected. And that you, if you don't keep those things in mind, then you will not design things in a way, I believe, that have the longevity and make the right type of decisions. The second is the, the law of consequences. When you have a system, if you do something here, it's going to impact something here. And so that whole notion of taking or thinking yeah. through consequences, um, I, I'm afraid that we're training people as we are focusing on being more and more agile, moving more and more quickly, that it's in technology and in society that we're losing some of that system thinking. And, and, the, and I think that the trade-off is always, I mean, whenever we had systems mm -hmm. conversations in the past, putting my old systems hat on, trade-offs, we have overhead. Right. Should we have more memory? How do we handle things? So right. this is kind of a, that's just what happens. You talk about consequences. But we don't have all those, we, yeah. I'm older than you, <laughs> but we started at a time when the, we were limited we were limited by memory, we were limited by processing, we were limited by bandwidth. And at different times as the industry emerged, the constraints were in different areas. Today, you don't have any of those constraints. And so if you don't have any of those constraints, you don't get trained in thinking about trade-offs and thinking about consequences. So when, when we come into just uh, what drove me to write this, one set of things are foundational 
issues. And what I mean by foundational, it's, it's our relationship to technology. And the fact of the matter is, as a society, um, we put technology on a pedestal and we have, uh, this is not to be taken out of con, uh, this is not to be taken the extreme of talking about people, but overall, our relationship with technology is a bullying, controlling relationship. That's why I called it authoritarian You need technology. to upgrade your iPhone to the new version. Well, you know, whether it's as a user that you're giving up your, your, your authority to all these notifications and to your addiction, whether it is the fact that it is the control with the data, whether it is predictive AI algorithms that are reading your unconscious behaviors and telling you what you think, because if it's suggesting what you buy, putting things in front of you. So there are all of these behaviors that our relationship with technology is not a balanced relationship. And you could, when you have a culture where the companies that, are, that have that power are driving towards, it's a culture of moving fast, growth only, don't think about the consequences. It's not just the unintended consequences, but it's the consequences of intended use. So the business models, and, and, and which we don't need to go into because I think a lot of other people talk about that, all end up with a situation which is unhealthy for us as people and a humanity and for us as a society. So you take that part and it is, um, it, there's a parallel here and we should learn from what happened with industrial, uh, the industrial revolution. We want progress, but if we don't pay attention to the harm, the harmful byproducts and trade-offs of progress, it's why we have issues with climate. It's why we have plastic in our oceans. It's because you, you judge everything by progress is just growth and industrialization without thinking about well-being or the consequences. Well, I believe we yeah. now face a similar challenge of digitization. So it's not industrialization, but it's digitization that has byproducts in a whole number of areas. And so what the, the article does is get into those specifics, whether it's data or anxiety, how we think, our cognitive abilities, our ability to solve problems, all of those things are byproducts of progress. And so we should debate um, where we, what we're willing to give up. One last thing, and then I'll let you come in, which is one of the problems with both of these is um, is humans value convenience. We get addicted to convenience. And if somebody gives us something that is gonna make things more convenient, it's sure as hell to go backward. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons, um, the combination of measuring our um, goodness as a country or as globalization by economic growth and measuring our personal wellness by convenience, if something is more convenient, we're happier. Take those two together and it makes a dangerous co combination because then our need for convenience gets manipulated for continued economic growth and it doesn't necessarily yeah. end up in uh, progress from a well-being perspective. It's an interesting point about the digitization because the digital industrial revolution or the digital revolution that's happening has consequences we're seeing them. And you mm -hmm. point them out in your post, Facebook and, and fake news. But there's also the global landscape, there's the political overlay, um, there's societal impact. There's not enough scholars that have been trained in the art of understanding interrelationships mm -hmm. of technology impact. Mm -hmm. it used to be a nerd thing. Right. And now um, our, my kids are growing up digital natives technology is mainstream, mm -hmm. so there it is, politics, you know, the first hacked mm -hmm. election. Uh, some the, pr the troll, the first president, mm -hmm. actually trolled his way to the president. I said that on the queue, that was my position. He actually was a successful troll, and, and he got everyone, he trolled the media, and he got the attention. These are new dynamics, this is reality. Mm -hmm. So, as you look forward and bring these ideas up, I want to get your thoughts on 
um, ideas on how to bring people together. Mm -hmm. You've been on one as a CTO of Cisco Systems, I know, you've been, also been on boards. This is a cross-pollination opportunity mm -hmm. to bring people together to, to think about this. How do you, do you look at that? How do you view how to take the next steps as, a, as an industry, mm -hmm. as a society, and as a global mm -hmm. nation mm -hmm. eventually? Because mm -hmm. cybersecurity, privacy, mm -hmm is becoming polarized also on a geography basis. You right. go to China, they got GDPR's hardcore there in Europe. You got Asia with the Chinese, and you got America mm -hmm. being America. Mm -hmm. It's kind of complicated. Mm. As a system architect <laughs> thinking, how do you look at this? What is the playing field? Where are the guardrails? What's your thoughts on this? Because it's a hard one. Right, so it is a hard one. And it isn't, um, it isn't easy to pave out a path that says it's solvable. Um, nor does climate right now, but you have to believe we're going to figure it out because we have to figure it out. So um, I think there are a lot of pieces that we need to start with and then we need to uh, adjust along the way. And um, one piece is, and, and let me back up, I am not, I don't believe we can leave this up to the industry to solve um, the incentives and the value systems and the understanding of the issues, the industry is coming from an industry perspective. And you can't also, you also can't leave it just to technologists because technologists have a technology pers perspective. I don't believe that you uh, just can have governments solve it for a variety of reasons. One is it, it, it takes a spectrum of things. Two, legislation tends to be retroactive not forward looking and you need to be really careful not to come up with regulation that actually reinforces the status quo as opposed to making something better. But I, I think we need to, we do need to figure out how to govern yeah. in a way that includes all of these things. So one. Well, just to interrupt you mm -hmm. a second, it's clear that watching the Facebook hearing and watching Sundar Pakai in front of the, the house, our current elected officials actually don't even know how the internet works. So that's one challenge. So you have a shift, it's a reset. Right. This and, is a and big it's dynamic. And it's actually, uh, if you think about the way uh, legislation often gets made, one of the problems with our democracy right now, I'm not going to put it in quotes, but I <laughs> want to put it in I quotes, will, yeah. um, is that the influence of money on our democracy means that so often the input to legislation comes from an industry. So whether it's, again, big tech, big pharma, big oil, big, that's the way the, the cycle works. In places where we have had successful legislation, that industry input, which you need industry input, mm -hmm. you just don't want industry to be the only input, mm -hmm. that is balanced with other input. And so we need infrastructure in the world and the country that has policy ideas, technology. This needs to come from civil society, from the academy, from nonprofits. So you need, the same way we have environmental sciences, we need to fund yeah. from government, not just industry funded, yeah. that science. That's number one. And then we need ways to have conversations about influencing companies to do the right thing, some of it is going to be through legislation. Some of it is going to be fr through pressure. This in some ways is like tobacco. In some ways like it's like food. In some ways it's like yeah. climate. Big tech. Um, and it's so, and, and underlying any of this to happen, we need people to understand and to speak up because awareness amongst, whether it's individuals, parents, teachers, we need to give people the information yeah. to protect themselves and to push back on companies and to rally, push back on government. Because if, if there's not an awareness, if people are walking around yeah. saying, don't take away my service, don't make this less convenient, don't tax my soda, don't, don't tell me what to eat. Don't tax my text messages. That's right, <laughs> so, so that. and I'm not saying taxes are yeah. the way, but if there isn't, what, what I'm focused on is how do we build awareness how do we get information out? How do we get yeah. companies like yours and others that this becomes part of our yeah. messaging of understanding so we can be 
talking I, about it. I think it's, uh, you know, back to, to the glory days of the TCPIP internet revolution, you send a packet from here to there, it's a step, take a first step. Mm -hmm. I personally, listening to you talk feel, and I've said this on theCUBE many as people know that, who know my, uh, my rap know that I've been pounding this. There's a counterculture in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Countercultures is where action happens. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, you talk about tax, regulation, and you know, the current generation is inherited. It is what it is. We have, you know, you're laying out essentially mm -hmm. the, the current situation. John Markoff wrote a great book, What the Dormouse Said, talking about how the 60s counterculture mm -hmm. influenced the uh, computer industry from you know, breaking in for getting computer time for time mm -hmm. sharing to the hippie revolution. Question I have for you, and put you on the spot is, is there a counterculture in your mind coming? A digital hippie quotes, is mm -hmm. there? Because I feel it, I feel that to let the air out of the balloon before it pops, mm -hmm. something has to happen, and I think it has to be a counterculture. I yet, I yet can't put my finger on it. Maybe it's a digital kind of a revolution, something compelling that says, whoa, Time right, out. Right. I, th I think we need a couple of countercultures <laughs> in that, in, in layers of it, because um, I think there is going to be, or is starting to be, a counterculture amongst technologists and the technology industry and entrepreneurs who are some, it's still small, who are saying, you know what? This chasing unicorns and fastest growth and scale, f you know, uh, move fast and break things, but um, we want to move fast, but we want to think about whether we're breaking, what we're breaking is really dangerous. You know, move fast and break things is fine, but if it's, oops, we broke democracy, that isn't something that uh, that is, I'm sorry. Y you have to think yeah. about and adapt more quickly. So I think there is, are people who are talking about, let's talk openly about the harm. Let's not just be tech optimists. Let's understand that. It's small, but it's beginning, and you're seeing it in AI, for instance. Yeah. The people who are saying, look, we're technologists. We want to be responsible. This is a powerful weapon or tool, and let's make sure we think about how we use it. I, let me just say one thing, which is I think we need a, another kind of counterculture, yeah. which I'm hoping is happening in a number of areas, which is societally saying, you know, we have a slow food movement. Maybe we just need a slow down a little bit movement. So if you look at mindfulness, if you look at kids who are starting to say, you know what, I want to talk to someone in person. I don't. So we, we need some of that counter movement where I'm hoping the pedestal starts yeah. to come back in terms of people looking for real connectivity and not just numbers of connections. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, everything has a symmetrical response if you think about it, for every fake news payload and network effect is potentially an opposite reaction right. of quality and network effect. It's interesting, and I, and I don't know where it is, but I think that's, um, and it could be filled certainly on the economic side by new entrepreneurial thinking. Mm -hmm. um, like one observation I'm making is, uh, you know, there's the, remember the old bad boys of tech, um, and you're smiling, now it's bad gals too, um, which is growing still on lower numbers. So I think there's going to be a shift to the good, the good folks, right? The, the, well, but she's a she's a good entrepreneur. Right. She's not just out there to make a quick right. buck. Or hey, mission driven's a signal yeah. we're seeing. Yeah. So you're starting to see a little bit more of a swing to whoa, hey. Let's recognize that it's not about, you know, quick buck or. Yeah. So, yes, but between you and I, it's teeny compared to the other forces. So, that's what those of us who believe that needs to happen need to continue to. What are those forces? Uh, Money making? Um, uh, what's your thoughts uh, on those forces? I think it's a combination of uh, money. <laughs> and how much money dry celebrity culture. Um, the forces, the power that's in place is so strong that it's hard to break through. Um, Short-term thinking, not even being trained. So, like so many things in yeah. our culture where you have entrenched power and then you see uprising and you get hope and that's where yeah. you need the hope. But um, we've seen it so often in so many mo uh, movements from race to gender, where you th think, oh, that's solved. No, it's not solved. And then you come back yeah. at it and come back at it. So I just, um, 
I would argue that there is little bits of it, but it needs fuel, it needs continuity, it, it, and the reason I think we need some government regulation yeah. is it needs help because it, it's not going to happen Let me naturally. ask you a question. I, you know, some successes that I point out, Amazon Web Services, Google even, um, have, have that a long game kind of narrative. They're always kind of, were misunderstood at first. I mean, remember Google was like, oh my search is not doing too well, and then the rest is history. Amazon was laughed at, Amazon Web Services was laughed at. So people who have the long game seem to be winning in these transitions. And, and that's kind of what you're getting at. You think long term, the long game. Uh, if you think in terms of the long term vision, you then going to look at consequences differently. How many people do you run in the valley that actually think like that? I mean, okay, so <laughs> we're, we're talking about two different things. One is long term thinking, and I do think that Apple, Google, Amazon have taken long-term thinking. So they're a good example, but if you look at them, uh, if you look at the big companies in terms of the way they approach the market and competition and their potential negative impacts on overall society, they're part of the power. They're not yeah. doing anything to change the systems yeah. to not the have them richer. continue to yeah. benefit from the, the power. The rich get richer. So there, this, this is why it's complicated. There are not good guys and bad guys. There are, these people are doing this and that. So do I think overall, do I see more long-term thinking? Um, not really. I think that um, the incentives in the investment community, the incentives in the stock market, the incentives culturally are still very much around uh, shorter term thinking. Not that there aren't any, but. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I, mm -hmm. it tends to be, you know, hey, we're, we're crushing it, we're winning. Right. You know, look at us, growth hack. I mean, just the language and semantics, you look at that. I think it's changing. I think Facebook is, I think, poster child of short term thinking, growth hacks, move fast, break stuff, and look where they are. You know, they can't actually sustain anything, a brand outside of Facebook. They have to buy Instagram and these other companies to actually get the kind of growth. But certainly Facebook has dominated on the financial performance, but they're kind of sitting in their situation. I think you know the, the programmer movement, I think, is kind of mm -hmm. moving through um, the, the Y Combinator uh, culture of, okay, let's get some entrepreneurship mm -hmm. going, great, rah, rah. I think that's stabilizing. I think we're seeing that with cloud, real science and, and thinking around AI for good. Mm -hmm. So that's a positive sign. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear that from you. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> it, uh, and I'll you're probably I'll agreeing take, with it. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I'll take that and and take that into feeding my hope because I hope. Yeah. Um, well, the Me Too I, movement is classic. Right. Look, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. I think transparency. And my final question to you before we get to some of the right. more entrepreneurial questions is: if you look at the role of community. Right. Um, and data science and connectedness. One of the things about being connected is you got potential potential for collective intelligence. So if you look at data as a set of networks, right. what if there was a way to kind of hone that network to get to the truth faster? Um, something we've been working on here, and I think that's something that you know changes media, it changes the game, but collective intelligence and the role of the community now becomes a stakeholder and potentially laying out some of these problems. Um, and you're part of the Mayfield community, which we're co-creating this video with. The role of community is super important, people. Right. The role of the, of the person, your thoughts on, so on community I, I, and role I of people. I think community is a uh, word that is, uh, has, takes on a lot of meetings. And the, the problem is when you mean it one way and use it the other way, the same as data-driven. So I think there's at one level, which is community and connectivity that has to do with um, collecting input from lots of sources. And when you talk about investigative journalism or they're in environmental situations or all sorts of areas where the ability to collect information from lots of sources that are interested and analyze that information, uh, that is one level of community and connectivity and networking because of people you know, which is great. There's another type, when people talk about community, they mean a sense of community in terms of what humans need and what that connectivity is. And most online networks don't give you that level. The online needs to be augmented by uh, interpersonal understanding. And one of the problems, I think, with today's technology 
is we're fitting humans into bits that technology can support as opposed to recognizing what are our human needs that we want to hold on to and saying there are some things that are not going to fit into somebody's data set. So in that first type of community, then absolutely, I think yeah. there's lots of benefits of the cloud and wisdom of the crowd. But if you're talking about humans connecting and people, um, you don't have the same type of, uh, that, that real community, online tools can help but we should never confuse what happens in our online world Judy, with Judy, real Judy, final human question touch. for you. I know we got, we're, mm -hmm. we're pushing the time here. Thank you for your spending the mm -hmm. time. First of all, it's a great conversation. Um, you've seen the movie with Venture Capital from the beginning. You know all the original mm -hmm. players. You're seeing what is now. Just where does it come from? Where are we? What's the state of VC? Is there any hope to the future? Are they all adding value? How do you see that evolving and, and where are we with? You know, I, I, I would, uh, I think, uh, venture capital has gone through a lot of different phases and like so many things, especially those of us who are entrepreneurs, we like to lump them all together. <laughs> They're not all together. Yeah. There are some, some good uh, ones out th there. Th th yes, like some, Mayfield. Yeah. Um, and um, the, uh, I do think though that um, something shifted uh, in the lead up to the dot com uh, and later the burst. And what shifted is venture capitalists before that time were company builders. They were the financiers, but they saw themselves with the entrepreneur building companies. Because of the expansion leading up to 2000, um, and the funds grew, and the people coming into the field, were they became more bankers and they took more financial, as opposed to balancing finance and, and entrepreneurship, it felt like it moved more into, this is a private equity play. Um, and I think the dynamic with entrepreneurs and the uh, methodology overall shifted. And I don't know that that's changed. Now again, not across the board. Yeah. I think there are some, uh, those firms that have identified or partners within firms who still very much want to yeah. build companies and partner with entrepreneurs. But I think the dynamic shifted. And if you view them as that's what they are as private equity investors and don't expect something else, yeah. if people need money, that's a go yeah. pick ones that are the best partners. Pick your partner. If you want a banker, go here. If you right. want a builder, go there. Right. Key distinction. Judy, thanks for sharing that insight. We are at Judy Estrin, CEO of JLabs, author of Closing the Innovation Gap, as well well-known entrepreneur, advisor, board member, uh, formerly CTO of Cisco, and again, great guest. Thanks for coming on. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE Conversation, part of May Mayfield, People First with theCUBE. Thanks for watching.